The power of the Magnificat has impressed us for so long in terms of understanding of who Mary is and how we can identify with Mary. And Mary, as one, I remember one writer talking about Mary and how to describe Mary. He spoke about the whiteness of Mary and that Mary wasn't just ordinary white, as you might see her there in the statue. It's not just a statuary white. And he said it wasn't even personal white. It's Marian white. There's a type of whiteness, a type of image about Mary, but even that doesn't do Mary justice. Mary was someone who was real. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is somebody that is very, very real to us here in Knock, certainly real to the people who witnessed her in 1879. And I suppose the Magnificat draws that essence in terms of Mary's expression of faith in God and what he has done for her. And this afternoon, we have as our speaker, John F. Dean, Mayo poet, who will be speaking Mass, Bringing Mary Home. He has already conducted a workshop for us with the title Realizing Mary, Faith and Family. It was a wonderful workshop, wonderful. And uh, those of you who might get a chance to go at six o'clock, I highly recommend it. John himself was born in Ackle, author of several publications of poetry and two novels, as well as short stories. He's the founder of Poetry Ireland and a member of that special group called Eastona, which is a group of artists around the country, a select group that are brought together for, well, for their imagination and talent and certainly highlighting the talent we have in this country in terms of poetry and story and art, various arts, art forms. In 2007, he was honoured by the French government as a chevalier or a knight of the Order of Arts and Letters. It is my privilege and honour, and we extend a very warm knock welcome to John F. Dean. Good afternoon. It's perhaps not very often that you get a knight from Ackle Island speaking to you about the Virgin Mary. I came here to knock as a child about twice every year when I was growing up and remember well walking around the old church saying the rosary and suffering rain. That is my memory of rain. And I was a child and didn't understand what on earth was going on, but I knew I was supposed to pray. So I always remember praying that Mayo would win the Connacht title a particular year. Didn't happen every time, but she did answer the prayer now and again. And she has done very well so far this year. And uh, we can all pray that uh, Dublin will also be defeated fairly soon. <laughs> I was born and brought up on Ackle Island. And during my adolescent years, Crow Patrick was always there, sometimes visible, sometimes a ghost beyond Atlantic mists. And from Kiel, I could see by night the magical beam from the Clare Island lighthouse as it swept slowly across the bay. The mountain and that light, they became something of a dream for me, something magical, something distant, something beyond me, known only in my imagination, because I never, in all those years, climbed Crowpatrick nor did I ever make it out as far as Clare Island. I suppose when something is so close to you, you keep putting off having to bother doing what you know you should be doing. In very much the same way, Mary, the mother of Jesus and my God, was a statue, dressed in gentle blues and whites, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array. But she, too, for me in those years, was a dream. Her dogs, I knew, barked at the moon. You are not supposed to look at the sun. And I am opposed to violence in all forms, and particularly to battles, armies in battle array. We also had a picture on the kitchen wall, and I'd like you to envisage it if you can. It was, I'm sure you've all seen it. It was a picture called the mother of perpetual succor. 
It was an icon, a very strange, very remote, very beautiful icon. And I loved it, but it meant very little to me. Just like the statue of the child Jesus of Prague, that triangular kind of statue whose head kept falling off and that you had to stick on with plaster so very often. All of that meant so very, very little to me. However, I did eventually climb Crow Patrick. By then, I was 68 years of age and rather unfit. But it was a fine morning and I set out my knapsack on my back as cheery as a Boy Scout. It took me about 10 minutes to realize that I was making a very big mistake. Reality hit me. I got sore and tired before I knew where I was, but I stuck it out and made it up as far as the saddle, if you know Crowpatrick. And there I took a long rest. Perhaps I shouldn't have because the rains came and the rest of the mountain disappeared. The top half of it disappeared. But I carried on and I made it to the top. I remember leaning against the wall of the chapel, absolutely exhausted, realizing I had reached the chapel, but still, although I was leaning against it, the rain was so heavy, I couldn't see it. And that coming down was one of the most difficult things I think I've ever done. I will never climb Crow Patrick again. Um, it has become a reality to me, and I respect it far more than I ever did before. And then Clare Island, the lighthouse. I was lucky enough to spend one night there this summer as a kind of gift, a grace. It's now a five-star hotel. The light is not used anymore, um, but we were given a room called the Ackle View Room, and it was incredibly beautiful to look out over the sea from a new angle and see where I was born from a distance in a totally different light. The island was totally different, and the lighthouse was totally different, from what I had ever imagined it would be. So now I know Clare Island and I respect it and the lighthouse very much. I was also born on the 8th of December in the year 1943 when the war was on. Because of the date and the feast that was in it, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, I was given as middle name Mary caused me some problems in Bonacurry National School as I was growing up. But it did help to inculcate in me a consciousness of Mary and a certain amount of love for it, for her. I tried to make that devotion a reality. But sometimes I think of the litany that we used to say when we'd speak of the Tower of David, the mystical rose, the Tower of Ivory, the House of Gold. And I found it very hard to feel myself in any way able to speak to somebody that was a House of Gold or a Tower of Ivory. It was very beautiful, the words are lovely, but I couldn't get past them. So I made a study of Mary, of who she was, of her first century Palestine where she lived under the very aggressive Roman rule. I think I got to know her so much better as a very real living person. I have realized Mary. And now I can feel that I speak with her, honor her, and love her. And what I find far more important and more difficult to do is to be, to be aware that Mary loves me and to be able to allow that love to penetrate into myself. I find that difficult, but I try. And when I tried to pray to Mary, I found I was always using words that other people had given me. The Hail Mary, the Rosary, the Memorare, all very beautiful, very real words. But now I realize I was talking too much at her, using other people's words. Why didn't I just stop, try and say my own words to somebody that I might get to know and then listen to see is there a response, and there is. So who is Mary, and who was she? 
Many, many studies have been done about her life and times. And roughly, this is the way I see her now. Mary, whose name was and is Miriam, was a young Jewish woman, scarcely past puberty when she was engaged to Joseph, a local young man. She was asked if she would consent to bring the Son of God into the world. She assented. She made a difficult journey, which we have just heard, to her cousin Elizabeth, across very dangerous territory, to be there for the birth of John the Baptist. She knew the pains and fears of giving birth. She suffered the dangers and dread of being a refugee, an asylum seeker in Egypt, because the life of her child was threatened. She knew the sufferings and anxieties of bringing up children, and that truancy of the bold boy, Jesus, who disappeared in Jerusalem and vanished for three days. What a nasty thing to do to one's parents. And that upset Mary, and she asked, why did you do this? And I was happy to see, well, Mary didn't understand everything, so I could love her and understand her even a bit more. She watched her child die a dreadful death. She was there at the crucifixion, and she was there with the disciples in the upper room afterwards. And this is the real Mary, a living, suffering, and loving woman who knew and knows still all our human difficulties, all our human anxieties. She is the one who brought Christ into the world. She is still the one who brings Christ into our homes, into our lives, into our families. She is the real person, friend, woman, worker, whom we invite into our homes. So whatever happened in Knock in August of 1879, and whatever it is that keeps on happening here. We know for facts and faith that Mary of Nazareth, Miriam of Nazareth, is close to us as patron of our lives should we offer ourselves to her care and as exemplar, persevering and unquestioning love. I mentioned earlier on the painting, the picture of Mary mother of perpetual succor, and that it was on the wall of our house. And I've written a poem for the first, this is a new poem which I've written today because I, I understand things a little bit better by forcing myself to shape my thoughts by a poem. As a child as well, I was a lonesome kind of a guy. I used to love to ramble around the island of Achill on my own. Nowadays, everywhere I ramble, I am happy to feel that there is a presence with me. And that presence is still that same Mary, the mother of perpetual succor, which I couldn't understand at all in those earlier years. So this is a new poem, and I'm calling it Icon. I found no comfort in the eyes, nor in the stylized dark night blue and gold star threaded drapes and garments. This was, I was told, mother of perpetual succor. The gaze of that teenage child boy was turned away towards winged angels in a brown sky, and the words troubled me. Sucker and perpetual, and the alien title, icon, something eastern and vaguely threatening. What I loved in those days was the sense and pleasure I knew of being alone, scuffing my shoes on the wooden floor of the hayloft, where spillicles of hay still lifted in almost invisible hay dust, making me sneeze and I could relish the sounds of me happening in a world that I alone inhabited. Often in the slow and persistent rains, shifting like ghosts across the fieldscapes of the West, I pressed my face against the window, suffering boredom, 
Mother in the dark kitchen baking soda bread and the icon always watching me, those long and sculpted fingers, the eyes attentive, inquiring, broaching sorrow. And she watches still, and still I am aware, though now I know her name, Miriam, her village, Nazareth. I know the flowers that grow by her back door, and how she baked her barley bread in a hot oven shared by neighbours. She, along with all the living and the lost beloved dead, is a presence now for which I am grateful, sensible of her care, her suffering, her ever-inquiring eyes. And so, on the 8th of December 1943, the day I was born, the world was stretched feverish under war. There was a fall of snow, they told me, over the heathlands. Ackle, my island. Call me John, after the evangelist. And Francis, after the poor and love-tossed fool. And call me Mary, for the day that's in it. And for mother, worn after the pain and tearing. There were men wading to an underworld of blood and muck during that war, uncomprehending. And I can still hear the winter storms crying through the pine grove. And mother, Mary, mother and son, Madonna, a winter child. And because of that war and all its horrors, I think of Mary at the foot of the cross, watching the agonies of her son and trying to hold him for one last time before he is taken from her for burial. And I can see all mothers before Mary and ever since Mary appealing to that mother who knew the pain of the loss of a child and who is there now fully understanding, deeply sympathizing with every mother's pain. And I see Syria. I see Iraq, <coughs> I see Afghanistan, I see Palestine, I see the tubs and the old wrecks of boats where desperate refugees are trying to cross the Mediterranean towards hope. And I can pray to the Queen of Heaven and to the real person, my friend Miriam of Nazareth, that she come to our aid. Amen.